everybody. Welcome to another episode on the challenges and triumph of online teaching during this COVID-19 at the Female Educators Roundtable with host Debbie Eno and two more of my guests from around the world. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you everybody for tuning in and apologies, we're a little bit late coming on. There's been a lot of issues trying to log on as usual. Whoa, we frozen. Okay. <laughs> right. Welcome. Can you introduce yourselves, please? Yeah, we've just been frozen, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Introduce yourselves, please. Can you hear me? So, um, yes, as you say, it's a little delayed. So I'm Michelle Wright Jump. I am a K through five teacher in New York. Uh, by way of Jamaica. I taught in Jamaica as well. I've been oh, teaching yeah. for 35 years and um, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you for accepting the offer. Welcome. All right. My name is uh, Marianne Otio and I'm from Nigeria. I teach at uh, LES, but right now I'm uh, teaching a uh, grade four to grade six. Okay. And it's nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for coming on and accepting the invitation to come to share your experiences of teaching online. Because what we've been having is everybody sharing our experience for us. And I feel that it is necessary as educators, especially female educators, that we share our own experiences and people actually hearing it from us. We are looking at um, some of the challenges in relationship to stress, you know, or anxiety or feeling overwhelmed or feeling lost on the online platform. For me, mm -hmm. one of the challenges is feeling totally lost and out of connection. Because as educators, we are so used to teaching in the physical classroom. And the fact that we were forced to come onto an online platform, which is and was very alien to us as educators. And as all educators know, they had no choice than to do crash courses, either teaching themselves sure. or using YouTube as the teacher and the tutorial, etc., in order for us to maneuver the online platform to learn the skills that was necessary for us to actually teach our students. However, with that come a lot of stress because as educators, we always need to be in control, right? I don't okay. care what any educator say to me, they don't like to be in control, they are lying. As educators, yeah. whether or not consciously or unconsciously, we, yes. are, we are control problems. We are control break. Because in yes. our classroom, we are in control of our classroom. So yes. when we had to negotiate this online platform, we are not in control of it. And when you are not in control of a situation, it has a tendency to increase your stress level or bring on stress due to anxiety and uncertainty. So how have you guys find that in terms of anxiety, overwhelm, loss? What was happening for you in terms of the platform? So I think there were different levels of anxiety for all the parties involved. We like to say stakeholders. Um, there are different levels for parents, for educators, and for the students. But I have to say that I've been fortunate because I'm in a district that partnered with Google about three years ago. And we were being nudged in the direction of embracing technology. So yeah. we were offered um, training in school in, in, in our district. And so a lot of us were beginning to use some of the platforms that we had to eventually use 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Some people were hesitant, of course, and you know, with the daily load that teachers carry, not everybody willingly did it, but we were exposed to it at least. So in that sense, we were fortunate and that sort of eased the stress that I hear from other people who in other districts did not have that. Um, I found that there was a, a lot of information. It was information overload in the beginning. 
Like everyone just started dumping information into the Google Classroom and it became confusing for educators. Mm -hmm. And then parents started calling in and saying they were stressed because they just couldn't make sense of all the information mm -hmm. coming from every direction. Mm -hmm. And um, administrators started saying, let's pull back a little bit and let's, you know, like channel the things we want for, per grade level. So we were able to pull back a bit and make it more manageable for families. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say though, I think the stress got to quite a few of our kids. Our kids, quite a few of them fell through the cracks, I have to say, or fell off the map. Mm -hmm. And we've been concerned about them, in particular our ELL students, our students with disabilities, students who normally engage, were not mm -hmm. engaging. And surprisingly, students who were introverted were now showing their skills. There were kids who were online working all the time. Mm -hmm. So we saw diff a different side of our students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Melita, what was it like for you? Okay, for my school, <laughs> all right. We've been on the use of the... Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you better now, yes. Okay. For my school, we've been on the private uh, computer for a while. We had the kids get the computers, but some parents did not buy. We've had them go online, do research work, but it was not like we were always online learning with the computers. For the classes between grade one to three, they were not made to you know, get the pieces compulsory, okay? Mm -hmm. But for grade four to grade six, they made it compulsory for them to all have. Each student should have at least a PC for days where we have to connect. And if you're not coming with a PC that you bought from the school, you could come with a PC, maybe your dad's laptop or your mom's laptop. So we had them using laptops. So it was not like it was new to them. But the problem was that not every child had mm -hmm. a laptop. Mm -hmm. So now that the pandemic came up, we had issues with children connecting from the house, those who did not have at all, those who wanted to use their parents' laptop and the parents had to work, they were on essential duty. Mm -hmm. We had issues with people who were not able to even connect because the network was bad or they didn't have the Android phone. So it was like a 50-50, those who were already connected, those who knew how to use the internet, it was not a problem. They could connect easily. To teach that set was fine and easy. But those ones who were just coming on board, who their parents had to get a phone for, it was a big problem. Sometimes you have parents calling you to ask you how to download Zoom how to connect. If you send uh, classes, if you send activities on a uh, Google Classroom, some of them don't know where to click to assess the learning for the day. So it was really, really stressful at some point. You have this good lesson planned and then you cannot deliver it because it's either you don't have the platform. If you send a video on WhatsApp too, they will tell you it's too heavy, the, the file is too large, they cannot download it. So it was more stressful for teachers than even the parents. Some of them were not bothered if they could not even connect. So it was you who wanted to evaluate yourself that had issues with knowing that I did not reach everyone. Right, I agree. I agree, I have to say, I was talking with a close friend and when we had our staff meeting, quite a few teachers expressed that they were up till one, two, three o'clock in the morning planning mm -hmm. lessons. Because as you know, Zoom, um, Google Classroom, there are certain um, facets of it that you have to, like you can um, attach lessons to it. And yes. it takes time to create some of the support systems, like um, creating a form, for example, or creating a drive document to attach to the classroom, downloading a mm -hmm. video, or just writing out the instructions for them. If it's in mm -hmm. person, you can model, you know, mm -hmm. you can repeat yeah. as much, you can scaffold, but online, mm -hmm. you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've, 
Absolutely. I found there were kids who would log on, say, I'm having difficulty. I'd say, I'm willing to work through it with you. I'll do a Zoom meeting and they just disappear because they became <laughs> so frustrated, you know, and uh, that hurt. There, there were quite a few kids who just did not even try anymore. Once they had the first challenge, it's not like being in the classroom and standing by them and just your physical presence kind of reassures them. Mm-hmm. it's very different very different mm-hmm. so from a student's perspective I, I feel for them mm-hmm. I really felt for my kids I still do and I still worried about what's going to happen in September when we reopen mm-hmm. although like um, like Melita said um, my school had all K not K actually three through 11 in my district mm-hmm. got Chromebooks to bring home on the first day that they got home they didn't have instructions, but they were used to using it. And K through two got packets, packets delivered to them for them to write. Um, but I'm finding although my kids had the Chromebooks, they still were not logging on. I don't think we had more than like 50% of the school. And we've been asking, have you been tracking those kids? Because in my district being an urban very large minority district with mm-hmm. immigrant an immigrant population. It's actually 92%, my school in particular is 92% minority and 81% mm-hmm. high poverty. And we call mm-hmm. economically disadvantaged. There were issues that existed before that was a, a, a oh. challenge for us. And the pandemic just exacerbated all of those issues. You know, I've had parents who were sick that was a challenge for the kids, mm-hmm. kids having to fend for themselves because their yeah. parents were sick. Several of them got sick with the pan- with the whole the, um, mm-hmm. um, Some of my parents are on the front lines. They work mm-hmm. in the health industry or they are working in a Walmart or, you know, because it's a low income yeah. area. So mm-hmm. it's just compounded all the issues that my families have had to deal with. Thank you. So you're looking at stress in terms of for your children, for your educators, for your parents. So the stress is not only one fold, it's threefold plus the community. So we're talking about four problems. Multiple layers. Multiple layers. And then in my community, um, where my school is located. Um, our county has around 15 major towns. There's some small other municipalities, but um, I think I'm looking at my figures here. In March, where my school is, there were 1,700 confirmed cases. It was the highest in the whole county. And today, they're saying, I looked today before I came on, there have been 400 and odd deaths versus 40 in adjoining counties, or I think the highest in adjoining counties. Um, there was one that had like 91 um, deaths, but we've had 490 deaths. And I think the figure I saw was 11,000 confirmed cases versus 1,000 in the adjoining counties. So... Wow. We are suffering. My my families, my parents, have stress upon stress. Mm-hmm. We've mm-hmm. lost yeah. lost a staff member, actually a sub. We lost oh. um, a grandparent. So I just oh. can't imagine. I know mm-hmm. we're looking at social emotional support, just because yeah. of yeah. the level of stress that my yeah. families are enduring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Melita, what's the situation in terms of your parents and your students and your, you know, your educators in terms of the stress level? What's happening there? Okay, for our stress level, I think um, it's just a regular thing. We didn't record any deaths. Okay, we didn't lose anyone. And uh, with the pandemic always uh, seeming like it's coming into town, everyone has to hide. You know, there were frequent lockdowns. Mm-hmm. 
at top of everything. He had plans to, if there's a complaint that a particular part is uh, looking like the threat is coming in from there, he will lock down the particular area for a while. So it was safer for us. We've not had issues within the state. We've had speculations, we've had cases, but we've not had deaths. We've only had cases, they will call numbers, they say 800, 500, but we've not had anyone close to us. And we've not had any child, grandparent or staff, missing or dying. So our case is still better. Okay. And uh, the only problem we've had is uh, we've had teachers not uh, having access to what they really need and when they need it. Because mm -hmm. if I need something from the stores and there's an impromptu lockdown, I cannot assess what I need. Most times mm -hmm. it's the power failure when you have to go online and then there's no power bank for you to connect your phone to. There's mm -hmm. no electricity for you to go online. That's the truth we face here. That's like the most important problem we have here. It's not even getting affected. It's access to the amenities that will keep you happy, mm -hmm. healthy. All right. So for us, we're actually more worried about uh, going out to make money have money to feed, have these kids eating well, being healthy when they come back to school. Mm -hmm. Because we have parents who don't have access to inflow anymore. Mm -hmm. We have staff, we're waiting for whatever we can make from the online uh, classes. That's what we get because we're not on the government's payroll. I work mm -hmm. in a private school. So the stress we feel is not coming from the pandemic directly. It's coming from the fact that your inflow is cut short the parents you're looking up to, to, you know, refund, they can't really pay. So when you do all of this, you go online, you teach and teach. And at the end of the month, you, you expect something big to come back and then you don't get as much as you want or need. You know, the depression and stress level would shoot up for you. So I think for my area, my city, okay, it's mostly not the pandemic. It's just access to inflow and how to survive. Mm. <laughs> so the pandemic affects you guys indirectly, isn't it? Whereas in terms of Michelle, it affects you guys directly in terms of the illnesses, etc. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Melita, is indirectly what the you know the um, the effect the effect of the whole thing in terms of you know what it is leaving in its way, i.e. You know, as a result of that, the lack of money, you know, you're teaching right. and parents are not able to pay. It's like all of that. So yours is the, you know, the, the, the after effect of the whole thing, which right. is just as stressful as if it yeah. is, you know, affected through the illnesses, isn't it? Right. It absolutely is. I, I have to say mine, I would say we have both stresses. Because as I said, you know, being an urban high poverty area, that's a, a big issue. We have a lot of transient parents and there are housing difficulties now. There is food shortage. There's a term my daughter tells me, mommy, it's not called that anymore. I'm looking. She said it's called food um, insecurity. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> so there is a lot of food insecurity in my area. So it's similar to Melita in yeah. terms of, you know, parents having to worry about that. And maybe that's why, you know, the support seemed like it's not as much for the kids. Mm -hmm. seem to some educators that they're not supporting the kids as much as they should but with that added stress of not knowing where you're going to live because in my where my school is situated there are multi-generational families multi-family dwellings and that's where covid thrives so they have that added issue but i have to say all isn't lost because my district did do a good job in terms of they were trying to get a hundred a thousand hotspots for the kids because again many of my parents can't afford um to, to pay for broadband service and our local um broadband service offered two months of free broadband for the community um i'm not sure what's going to happen now or next year but at least my district did go out of their way to try to get that for our kids um and they did i was telling Debbie before that they did um, our school is a hundred percent free meals because we qualify because of our high poverty so they okay. did arrange we closed on the 13th and by the 17th they were distributing food breakfast and lunch 
for all of our kids. So I have to give it to the district for doing that. So all is not hopeless. Yeah. You know? And the good thing I think that can come out of this, because I know when, when there's stress, we need some relief. I have to yeah. say it's a collaboration that's been formed. I've yeah. really been working. I am a collaborator generally, but I've been, I find I've been working more with classroom teachers, some who were hesitant before, I'm more open now. I've yeah. actually done, we did a whole school-wide video for the nursing homes in our area. And I facilitated with another teacher and our PTO, a Yale day of service project that started in our school, but now it's open to the whole entire district where kids can actually do something called placemaking, which is designing a, designing a park in our area. So it has really brought about a lot of collaboration. I'm collaborating with the public library, which I've always done. We had uh, two projects going on, we thought they were dead and I actually had her sign on as a co-teacher, which is something other teachers might try to do. She became a co-teacher in two of my Google classrooms. So I had an extra adult you know, who could keep, ta keep track of the kids, give them feedback. She recorded little videos. I recorded videos, so that worked wonderfully. And we're working on a book right now about our community, a collaborative book. So if anything good came out of this stress, That's it's that we're collaborating a lot more. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Melissa, I see you are nodding your head when she actually said in terms of so many resources that we've been getting. You want to share yours with <laughs> oh, Honestly, I think uh, one thing I learned from this whole situation is no one teacher knows it all and can do it all. You will only burn out. If yes. you continue to you think you <laughs> can do it alone, you will burn out. And when you burn out, the class is going to suffer. So at this point, collaboration is just everything. At some point, you let someone else lead while you rest. You know, the one-on-one -on -one we do in class, it's easier when you stand in front of the class, you can carry Absolutely. everyone along. You can see who is not catching up. But with this online thing, it was difficult. You know, you while you're teaching, you know that a particular child is not online. And if it's the child that is maybe the slow learner, and you're worried because if this child misses this class, you're not going back to teach it the way you've just done for today. Right. It's going to be a previous knowledge when you come back the next day. So you are lost. You are worried. You're teaching others. You're worried about the one sheep that is not attending. It's like the 99 is there, but you're worried about that one that is not there. So Absolutely. for me, I think this season, it gave me time. Yeah, it gave me time to let other people, you know, take the class and let me learn so I can learn to rest while they teach. So it yeah. was just great. I think mm -hmm. one other thing to Debbie and Lita is that you sort of reach into your toolbox and pull things out you didn't even know you had to deal with the stress. Really? So I ended, up, <laughs> I ended up recording a rap for my kids <laughs> my younger daughter <laughs> to get them and it actually engaged them several kids logged on and said we want to see more but yeah. <laughs> it was not sustained because i didn't keep doing it it was yeah. it was it took a lot to do um kids kept saying oh i'll log on if i see more and yeah. i just could not continue doing that whole it's just just not me, it. but it did eventually. I mean, it did initially, I should say, mm -hmm. get them more interested. I did yeah, get a few kids to buy in just by speaking their language. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the interesting thing about the online platform, as much as it's tiring and stressful and overwhelming, it have actually made us step out of our comfort zone, became very innovative and creative. Yes absolutely yeah True. absolutely you know but the thing is that came with a lot of stress because absolutely. the anxiety level of oh, constantly okay. checking i'm looking at Melita's face your face is a lot <laughs> it was stressful i'm telling you mm. even i mean i actually what i did too um is i we had a chance to go to school twice i think I was able to go once and I retrieved a lot of the work my kids had started 
to try to get the kids who were not engaged more engaged. And it took me days, weeks to actually upload their work. I uploaded a lot of their half done work to encourage them to come on. So I was doing a poetry unit with fourth grade. I was doing another unit um, about primary source documents. I brought all the things home, I uploaded them. Hope And that took hours to get that uploaded for an entire school. Because remember, I have the whole school, 500 and odd kids. It took me literally hours. But when I spoke to other teachers who said, you know, this is the same thing. I find I'm going to bed at three o'clock in the morning. I said, oh, at least I'm not alone. And then I started hearing my daughter who's in Japan. She was saying the same thing. You know, I have teachers around the country and around the world were saying the same thing. It is a lot more demanding, a lot more demanding to be online. Having to give, and you could have said something in three steps, three maybe three sentences, when you're typing it out, oh. it is very different. Or mm -hmm. even recording it, it is still very different. Because mm -hmm. you can't look at your kids and gauge whether or not they understand. I always thought, they always say to me, are you some kind of psychic or something? Because I'd look in their eyes and I'd say, you are looking at me, but you're not listening. And they'd be like, how did you know? I'm like, I've been teaching for many years and I can tell when you're just staring or you're engaged. Mm. That's missing. Mm. You can't see that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Milita, you were saying? Yeah, I was saying it's true. Like, honestly, the, the things you can do in a classroom, a regular classroom, like she said, with three sentences, you are done. Bring out your notes, let's start this activity, go to page this, and then you give the instruction, and you watch, you move around around to make sure everyone is doing it with the online you could just be typing for the next two minutes and by the time you come back online and uh, send the message you have like only two children online responding four will go off so it's a problem when what you could have just done one-on-one -on -one and then go to the next step you'll stop with step one Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of that could be questionable in the sense that, you know, you put it, there's a lot of output, but there's not a lot of thing coming back. Right. No response. And then we wonder about the achievement gap. What's, what's going to happen? I mean, yeah. we really can't afford for our kids to be falling further behind. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So that was my yeah. question. Yeah, but it's a, a matter of having no choice. You know, there is nothing else we could do. We are thrust onto this platform and it's a matter of no choice. And what comes with this platform is the pile of overwhelm, stress and anxiety. But because I think there be, we th I think we're going to have to find a way because this is going to be for a while the, the new normal, as they say here. And I, I was reading probably in April, there was a school in Detroit, Michigan, in, here in the US. Mm -hmm. And it's a smaller school, but the principal got out and knocked on the doors of every child who was missing. And several teachers in that um, um, district, not from the same school, but from the district actually joined her and they used many means of trying to reach the kids. They reached out to family members. They went on social media. They actually even went on online games to locate the kids because I know my kids were on online and one principal used TikTok to be able to find his kids. So I think uh, you talked about being innovative before. I think that's what it's going to take for us to reach all of our kids, considering all the issues that they're having. Go ahead, Melita. Okay, I will say it's going to take a lot more because truth yeah. is we worry about those that could actually connect and assess this information. While we have those who cannot even afford, you know, you had the Chromebook given to you, not like kids had to pay to get them. So here they have to pay to have access to these Android phones or the PCs, and they cannot even afford it. So even if I have to go around every week to, you know, 
you have to lobby for them to come online. Now we have to, oh, parents, please let your child stay online. It's going to help the child so that they don't go behind. They have to stay online to learn new yeah. things. They see to some parents, they thought, please, I'm tired. They should rest. Sometimes they log out of the groups, you have to add them back. They log out again, you add them back. So we have parents who don't really want to join the process. And then we have parents who would give anything to join, but they cannot afford it. So going around to knock on their doors is like you're lobbying, begging them to stay online. So the problem now is we're going around, teachers are were struggling to not drown. At the same time, we're trying to carry these families along. So it's really yeah. stressful, it's, it's too much. Absolutely. I think there are teachers though who there, I mean, there, there's one person I work with and I'm telling you, she is my age, but I look up to her and she has been going around with our nurse and she's been reaching out to families. And for her, yeah. it's stressful that she can't reach her kids. She's a special education teacher and she yeah. talks about the stress she feels, yes, from having to work extended hours, but more so because she knows all of the gains she's made with her kids are actually disappearing. So she's yeah. taking up on herself and adding more stress and physically going house to house at this point. Okay. I understand it now. I understand it better now with the special needs, but it's clearer. Yeah. I understand that. Now. It, you can't, with, even with the IEP, you know, even if you send the IEP home, it's never the same. It's no. never the same. So Definitely. I think I understand why she's going around. She's doing it because she understands when they resume, she has right. to start from the beginning. And Absolutely. This thing, as occupational therapy, she has to stay in touch be sure that they are doing exactly what she has done so far it's mm -hmm. it's not easy it's not not at all <laughs> you see that's why when people talk about educators these are some of the things we do especially yeah. if you're passionate about your student and you feel that you don't want them to be left behind Absolutely. you have not seen them for a while you know you feel that you need to make contact it's like all of that. So our job is never a nine to three, or an, especially around this time. Our job is all the time and it's erratic. For us. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Milita. No, I said our job takes 24 hours. Absolutely. We never rest. We never Absolutely. Rest. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's been yeah. it's been 24 hours before the pandemic. It was 24. <laughs> before so now we have to squeeze out some more hours out of the day now <laughs> yeah exactly 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 you see so when you look at it in terms of being on this platform is stressful overwhelming and anxiety ridden you could see why it is it's not so much the platform it is when you are not able to get on to the platform because right. I know for myself that sometimes I'm trying to get onto this program and I'm sitting there saying, you know what, just breathe. There is nothing else you could do. The internet <laughs> yes. is not connecting. You know, when you actually connect, the internet kicks you out. So, and then you're all over the place. And it is so easy to cause panic when you know that your students are at the other yeah. end and you cannot reach right. them. Right. So I'm not sure, Melita, is, is there any push for, like, there's a big uh, thing, you know, we go through all these different waves and these different terms in the US and in education around the world. We have something called social emotional training now. That's a big thing here. Okay. So they've been holding a yeah. lot of PDs. We have a social emotional team at school and they're trying to reach out and preparing for our kids when they come back. Is that something that you are doing there in Nigeria? Okay. Nothing officially from the government, all right? Okay. We've not, we've not had the government call teachers in to discuss how have you been, how have you been coping, these are the strategies we want you to take place, these are the things we want you to put in place. All they've asked us to do is, if you know you want to reopen your schools, these are the things we want you to have, maybe a, a sick bay, a bus that is functioning in case of emergency, 
the mm. hygiene, uh, hygiene protocol that you right. have to put in place. These are the things they've come up with, and these are just rules mm. that you have to put in place. But you see, I don't think anyone has thought about, you know, talking to teachers first, because when you're not mentally fit, okay, your emotions are everywhere. Right. You are not ready to come back to work. And mm. someone is saying, have a base for washing your hands regularly, right. sanitize often. That is not what I want to hear. I want to yes. discuss how I feel first. Then when I am stable, I can discuss with the children when they come back to teach them to right. be stable too. So, so there, for now, I've not had, I've not had no. any official training mm. on people coming to tell me, oh, this is what you've been through. I want to help you cope better. None. But I know where I come from, my school, okay, we have this group. We stay in touch often. We discuss things about our heads. We put, we put up links for teachers to go to read up also. These are steps we, we've done for ourselves, mm. okay, as a team. Okay, we've been holding up strong, encouraging each other. But the truth is we want more. We would love for someone from the government or the committee to come say, we want to meet with teachers. We want to discuss about what to do next and how you guys have, a, have been coping. So it, right, it's right. been that we've not had that push that you're discussing now we don't have right. it so we have had pd um our district has arranged pd and like self-help self-care kind of uh pds for, for teachers okay. and the social emotional is more geared towards the kids like how do we take care of their social emotional needs and again it's mainly because we're in this high poverty area so they're looking towards you know facilitating that sort of treatment for kids um but we do have pd uh on self 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 care okay. which i think we all need at this point yes. yes we all do it's important absolutely you see my thing is we are already stressed and overwhelmed and anxious especially yeah. if you've been told that you have to go back in september or the 1st of August, and you realize that these cases are increasing. So when people are saying that educators are work shy, educators are not work shy, educators are anxious and concerned, because you see, we are not able to, to visualize what physically distance look like in my classroom of 29 or 30. Right. <laughs> I cannot visualize that what's look like. And no. because I'm not able to visualize that, it brings with it uncertainty and anxiety and overwhelming. Of course. Absolutely. Same thing with us. We have a reopening plan. And unfortunately, in the States now, where you live will determine what happens to you in terms of going back 100% virtual mm -hmm. or what's called a hybrid model. Um, I'm fortunate I'm in New York and we have to follow our governor's guideline. So he has asked for all the schools by tomorrow to have their reopening plans in and they're guided by the CDC here. So I sort of am hopeful because, you know, I know that they're following the science and you know, they're putting to in place certain protocols. Um, but I know in other states, um, teachers unions are suing the government because teachers are so stressed. Teachers are now writing their wills in Southern <laughs> states. Teachers are now, uh, teachers are, yeah, there's a group of teachers who appeared in the cemetery and invited the governor to, call, to be their the executor of their wills. And teachers are resigning and retiring yes. at very high rates yes. here in yes. states where we're being forced. In fact, there's a relief bill that came out that's being proposed right now. It's $70 billion. And they're saying, two, they're proposing, one party is proposing two thirds of that bill will go to schools who are willing to open in person with an in-person component. I'm like, how dare you ask people to risk their lives? Now people have to choose between the love of their profession and their lives. What mm -hmm. is more stressful than that? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I've got some educators on my platform and they've actually been messaging me saying the same thing that they now have they have to choose 
in relationship to the health or going back to the school. Right. And some of them don't know what to choose. I had another one wrote a long letter resigning because they were forcing her to go back and she right. did not feel that she is prepared to go back because she's got three children that were under 10. And for her going oh. back was an issue. You know, another concern she had was she wanted to work from home on the online platform. And right. in her district, they were not allowing that to take place. So that was another okay. added stress. So not only are educators stressed in terms of teaching on the online platform, the stress is even twofold in relationship to going back into the physical classroom where right. they're being forced to go back. Right. Yes, Melissa. Yes. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, what I'm saying is uh, we have a problem. The problem is we have teachers who want to go back. And then we have teachers who don't want to. They don't want to think about it at all. The risk is too high. They would not risk anything. They would rather wait until they say everywhere is clear before they will go back. So when we start to argue, you want to go back, they're forcing you to go back. Oh, I want to go back voluntarily. And then it's like, oh, teachers, they're not agreeing. They don't have one voice. Okay. So I think it's that time where we have to decide. Okay, it's either they create a platform where every teacher speaks, because if you can speak for yourself and say, this is why I'm not coming online, and the next teacher says, I'm not coming online because of the same reason, then we will not look like some of us are selfish and the others right. really don't care. If, I agree. if you ask about teachers, you won't have the same response. So we were beginning to sound like some of us want to really go back, and then some don't want to go back. Right. So. But that's human nature, right, Melita? I think that's human nature. And I, I, again, in my district, what they did is we had a big meeting last week and they actually, they did send out surveys before to ask us of our, you know, what our choices are. And we had the choice of 100% in-person, 100% virtual or a hybrid, alternating weeks, alternating days. And on the meeting we had, 70% of people said they wanted to start with a hybrid, mm -hmm. but the district has decided that they're actually going to do online for September and oh, then okay. follow the numbers. Mm -hmm. The second biggest teachers union here in the States, the AFT, they have said that they are willing to support anything at this point that teachers will do. They said advocacy, mm -hmm. even strikes, they're saying they're willing to support. And they're putting out benchmarks of their own because it's so disjointed depending on the state that you live in. So the teachers yeah. in some states are more stressed than the ones in states that are saying they're, they're, these are the higher benchmarks and the ones that have no benchmarks, they have to be stressed out about going back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they just have to you decide. See. Sorry, Milito? I said they just have to decide. The decision has to be together. You don't want people, you know, for a union, the union will speak for you because you all, you've agreed on that. But right. now we've not even sat as a union. We don't know what the private school wants to do. We don't know what right. the government wants. It's just that here, the government school teachers, they don't want to go back. They're getting paid as they're in the house. You, a private school teacher, you're hoping they will sit, you know, negotiate, and then you reach a conclusion and know what right. next. So it's not easy. So you mm. haven't gotten any surveys or anything? Nothing. And they, have they decided so, what they're going to do for the opening in September? No, no, no lead yet. We're waiting Nothing. for, okay, we're waiting for them to actually meet, decide what they want to do with us because they have the say. We have to follow. Mm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, it's interesting. What is interested in is like all three of us <laughs> in the same situation because as much as the government saying that they want schools to be open in September, there are no clear guidelines for some schools because my son's schools haven't had, there's no clear indication, okay, we're going to have a hybrid setup or we're going to have a full on physical classroom. Some schools have already told the teacher that okay, we're going to go physically in the classroom. 
but the physical in the classroom, what does it look like? Because as you know, one of the challenges to keep students walking through the corridor, distance apart, how are you going to yes. do that? Let's be yes, realistic. Yes. Yes. I mean, again, <laughs> as you talked about stress, I mean, everything, every time we talk, it just, it just adds to it. It compounds the level of stress. Cause you said there's so many things to consider. You talked about Debbie spacing out your, your classroom with limited space. How can you separate your kids? How can you gather kids? There were so many questions in our, on one of the sheets they sent out that I intended to respond and there was no space. People are saying, when kids come in the mornings and gather in the front for you to check their temperatures, how are you gonna separate them? When parents wanna to come to school to pick their kids up, how are you gonna separate them? When a kid displays a symptom, where are they gonna be separated? I mean, there is, there's so many things to consider. As teachers, you know, we already have to carry so much and now for us to be, health professionals too, because in our classrooms, if someone displays a symptom, even if they're checked, we have to identify it and separate those kids or send them to the nurse. So now we are also healthcare professionals. Yeah, yeah. It's like That's I was saying hat. yesterday. Exactly, with everything else we're doing in terms of these numerous hats we're wearing, now, because of this pandemic and because we going back to school, we now have to be intense counselor that you actually have to check your children's temperature. Where are you going to have the time to do all of that? <laughs> I just see this whole thing as so stressful. The thought alone is stressful. Absolutely. Now, have you thought about the, the, the things they use in school, the writing utensils? Or what, what's going to happen? How, do we, how are we going to clean that? How are we going to clean, you know? It's mind-boggling. You see, when you actually think about the online platform, right? We had yeah. the stress and the overwhelm of starting on the platform. The feeling of feeling lost once you start on the platform, right? Now that we are possibly transitioning into the classroom, that brings with it a new set of stress. Yeah, because right. you are thinking, okay, how are you sorting out your classroom? What are you doing in relationship to your classroom? Milita, we've lost you. <laughs> right. What are you doing in terms of your classroom? And I keep on visualizing the classroom of 30. How are you going to, because the classroom alone is not enough to, to carry the 30 students. I've been in some classroom where they've got 30 students and some of them are sitting at the edge of the table because there aren't enough space to comfortably right. accommodate this 29 or 30 student. So the question is, how are we going to be able to accommodate them, having them distance apart? Right. And no one is saying to us, okay, we're going to have the class in half. We'll have one set of students appearing today, another set appearing tomorrow. Nobody's saying anything to us. And because educators are control freak anyway, we are, you know, we are anxious as to what would this look like? Right. Uh, in my district, they have a reopening plan that has to be submitted by tomorrow. And I think okay. it has to be out, out online by August 1st, I think. Um, okay. That's a part of what's required by the state of New York, mm -hmm. that they have to talk, they have to have certain protocols and it includes separate um, social distancing, checking temperatures, I think they're going to put up plexiglass and um, PPEs. <laughs> so all of that is delineated in our plan, but it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't take the stress off because they still have questions. Although they are supposed to be planning for us, they're still asking us, what do you think about there? Now they're saying they're going to use like the gym and other spaces for kids to sit in, but then it's still not enough room to separate the kids. And then Melita mentioned earlier, what about our lesson plans? Mm -hmm. Now the lesson plans have to be different. They have to be flexible. They mm -hmm. have to, we have to be at ready for when school closes down suddenly again, if and when, then we mm -hmm. have to go back to virtual if we're doing a hybrid model and your lesson plan has to reflect that. So mm -hmm. we have to be ready in the event of a sudden switch again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Okay. 
Sorry, Milita, what are you saying? I'm saying very true because the lesson plans, you know, if we regularly we had maybe like uh, five subjects a day or about four subjects a day, you have to shuttle in this uh, new protocol of uh, checking temperature, spacing them out, making sure things get done. So you're going to learn maybe about three subjects and within that period of uh, teaching, you have to also make out time to check on the kids to be sure that everything is going as planned. So we, we have the workload of making sure academics is there and then making sure that health is there. Right. Going. <laughs> so are they going to send us doctors and nurses to work with right. us? Right. So we can be fighting and they'll be checking off the kids. We won't right. mind. We won't mind. Mm. We can't do it alone. And then guess what? Mm. Do you know how some how some parents and some kids and some teachers can be paranoid mm. if so, one person coughs? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, God forbid! How do we control our kids? Because yeah. I'm telling you, when about 12 years ago, when we had at, at SARS, I think it was, I had kids going crazy. One kid coughed in the class. The whole class was ready to attack him. <laughs> Telling him he had SARS. So that's another thing we're going to have to try to control. Yeah. If one yeah. kid has the regular flu, mm -hmm. how do we control the other kids who are going to be feeling mm. stressed out about catching something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so true. That's something I didn't even think about. That's another added on the list. I didn't even think in terms of, you know, if one child just have an allergy and we know in terms of, some people right. allergy last throughout the year. So what are you going to do? How are you going to control this class where everybody feels that this child has right. a cough because it could be corona? So what do you do as educators? Oh. I know of cases where kids were ostracized pre the shutdown. Like when there was talk about it, um, there were kids who were being ostracized so a little bit in elementary school, but I know at the college level, I know there were kids who were totally ostracized because they came from certain countries. People labeled them as having Corona or their group having Corona. And yeah. they have been talking out about that discrimination yeah. and that bias. Yeah. So it, we're all humans. It's going to happen in, in K through 12 school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Do you feel that in light of all of that, in terms of the anxiety, some of the, you know, the overwhelm, the feeling of loss in the classroom, what do you feel in terms of school being opened in the physical classroom? What are your thoughts on that? Really, you want to go? Okay, I'm thinking if the schools are going to reopen for physical teachings, it's only fair that teachers believe that it's safe. If it is not safe, don't go out there. It's the same thing I'm going to say. I know for private school teachers, it hits harder, okay? Because you're not getting anything, but the truth is, we cannot go out there. If, if we resume for physical teachings and then the kids don't come to school, you can't teach yourself. So most parents are not ready for it. So also some teachers are fighting it. So I'll still say for now, the tension is still high. You could just uh, watch it out for August and by September, we could go back if it's safe. If it's not safe, I'm still not in support of it. Mm -hmm. So are you suggesting a hybrid model or total online model? For now, we could just do the online, online. Mm -hmm. Just that we won't carry every child along or it's safer knowing that they can learn online and we could always send home packages for them to meet up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Misha, what do you think? I I think I'm going to go with what my district has decided based on the majority of teachers in the district. As I said, we're a very large district with almost 12,000 kids and 70% of the teachers wanted the hybrid model. So I'm okay with that. Um, they're starting off with 100% virtual, which I'm also okay with. And our superintendent mm -hmm. assured us that they'll be watching the numbers 
or mm -hmm. AFT, the union said that they want to see 5% transmission rates for us, okay. to, for them to feel that it's safe for us, and 1%. Um, okay. I'm trying to remember what, the, what that 1%, mm, made a note of it. But I'm going to follow, I'm going to compare what the state government says, which is what my district is following, and what my union says, usually okay. they are in sync. Mm -hmm. So okay. I feel that they're following those numbers of the 5% infection transmission rate, then I think I'll feel safe going back to the hybrid model, not 100% mm -hmm. virtual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you think that this is going to add to educators' stress level if the whole system is going to continue online? Would you think in terms of our overwhelm, you know, like situation would be in terms of how overwhelmed educators would be, parents would be, etc., and the children, what do you think it's going to do with them in relationship to the stress, overwhelm, and feeling of lost if it's to continue on the online platform? Okay. I think the achievement gap is just going to be worse. I think the stress level okay. is going to get worse because remember in the beginning, we knew that this, we only had three months of school left. So we, we were stressed, but we knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel. But mm -hmm. to not know for the whole entire year, I can only see people being more stressed and distressed. Mm -hmm. I really feel like we're going to have to have a lot of social emotional training for staff. And mm -hmm. you know, kids are going to be damaged. Parents are going to be. Educators are going to be. And we're going to lose good educators. You definitely are going to, because they, if they feel stressed enough, they might not think it's worth it to continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people mm -hmm. have made that decision already, as I said before. They are so stressed that they are writing their wills and people are leaving in droves. Mm -hmm. Mm. Thank you. Milita, what's the situation in terms of, you know, Nigeria? What do you think is going to happen in relationship to the stress level, the feeling of overwhelm, you know, if you guys are going to be going back, you know, going into the online platform with all the challenges we already had initially. Okay, I, I think uh, it's for our case, it's different. The funny thing is when we get on a particular difficult project, you know, the stress is high when you are new on it. But with time, what I noticed, judging from what my school did and how well we survived through all of this, I think as time went by, okay, the stress level was not as bad as it used to be when we started. People were beginning to adjust, you know. When you're burning out and then you're telling yourself, I'm going to make it true. Because somewhere inside, you're hoping that the, the good you're doing will cover for the pain. So the stress level is going to go down because for me, I think the only time I feel stressed now is maybe when I'm trying to teach and the kids are not online and I've prepared a lot of things I want to do and I come online and they're not there, it hurts. So I go back and I say, after everything I've done, I couldn't achieve my goal for the day. But as a teacher, each day I go online, it gets better it gets better the pain is no longer there the body has actually reduced i can now connect it's only when i don't have power supply and the internet is bad then i can start worrying all over again so i think with the stress okay it's going to go down for us because we we'll always survive around here it's like what we we'll always do thank you that's interesting because you see for you guys in terms of the added stress of the increase of the virus, you guys haven't got that as much as the Western country. And you know what yes. is so interesting? These are the same Western country that is always ready to run down Africa. You know, and it's so interesting to see what's happening right now. It's the West that is really struggling in relationship to the virus. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's a whole turnaround, eh? It yeah. is. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, one of the thing is, as much as we are going to, we are supposed to be going 
you know, into the physical classroom in September, they still have a number of parents who are making decisions that they're not going to send the children because they are not convinced that the situation is Thanks. supported or the situation is thought of and there are things in place. As an educator, I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, I do not feel comfortable enough that the government have put enough things in place that would make me feel comfortable that things are sorted because in my head, I'm looking at it in terms of normally the toilet, keeping the toilet clean is a challenge. You yeah. go to the student, you, you go to the children's toilet, the children's toilet, and it's a mess. And that's no corona, that's just a mess toilet. So what is happening when we now have the virus in place and you have to think in terms of how are the students going to be using the toilet? I understand lunchtime where you're staggering the lunches. I hear that I understand that I can see that's working. But what I cannot see working is this toilet, the hygienic aspect of the toilet. Are they going to get people to clean the toilet every five, 10 minutes? That's one of my biggest things. You know, yeah. there is funny you said that because uh, during our staff meeting last week, that was one of the questions someone posed to the superintendent. Are you hiring additional custodian workers, custodial workers? Because she says already we have to bring in our own supplies to make sure it's as clean as we want it. So mm -hmm. what's going to happen in this case? And he mm -hmm. wasn't able to answer that. That's mm. all. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Melita. I'm saying um, they always want you to do a lot of things and then they're not sending in support. If they want all of this to you know, go well, they should send in support. We have, um, we, have, we have volunteers. They could send in volunteers for a while who would help out in schools. They should send in volunteers. You cannot have schools employ new hands and you expect them to see pay out of nothing to these new hands. They don't so have to. You're right. There's not enough money. I know in the States, they're always, as you know, in the States, our schools are funded by taxes. Oh, of wow. course, you know, the haves have more and the mm -hmm. have nots have very little. Mm -hmm. So the schools that ha are the have nots, like my district, we mm -hmm. don't have enough money already to provide the resources they need normally. Mm -hmm. How on earth are we going to find resources for the additional things? Mm. Mm. It's not easy. Mm. Hmm. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Melita. I said it's not easy. It's no. not fair. No, it, it's 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 not easy, and I find it um I find it concerning because we had one set of stress trying to understand the platform, and we've launched it, and we've ma I must say we're now very competent using the platform because we had no choice than to become competent. But right. the, other, the other set of anxiety now is, what does the physical classroom would look like? And in oh. terms of if educators are going fully online, it is not sustainable in relationship to being extremely creative all the time to make sure that you are able to engage the children. Right. So you see, that's one of the things. I feel that online classroom could work and it could work well, depending yeah. upon the age of the children you've got. Yeah. Because when you have children in terms of nursery age and primary age, it is very challenging to actually get them to engage in the online platform, get them to understand the online platform and get them to connect with you on the online platform. That's one of the things, that's one of, you know, the sadness I'm feeling for educators who teach those younger children. For me, teaching the, the 17, the 16, 17, 18 year old, is not too much of a challenge because they're older. And, you know, yes, you have to log on because you need to get yourself sorted for your GCSE and your A-levels. So you need to get that sorted. You know, this is what we need to do X, Y, Z, right? So that is not so much of a challenge, but when you have to do the younger children where it doesn't matter how much you are changing the, in terms of your goals and how much you are actually 
reminding them in terms of discipline, we need to see your face, you need to leave the computer on the table, you need to not move the computer, you know, it's like all of this. I just see the challenge. I cannot see a way out of this. No, that's true. I mean, in my district, our, our younger kids, K through two initially didn't have Chromebooks and eventually they gave second grade uh, Chromebooks. But K and one right now, I mean, before cl school closed, teachers were saying that they had not heard from most of their kids. And I gave yeah. a story time for the entire school. And I know I do something called Kami Shibai, which is Japanese storytelling. My kids mm -hmm. love it. Normally, if I have a performance, I have a full room, a full cafeteria. This, this um, when I gave it online, I had one or two kids show up and the highest number I had was probably 12 out of 511 kids. Wow. And classroom teachers were advertising it. It, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know for the younger kids, they're getting packets and teachers are reporting that they're not getting the packets back either. You see, in terms of getting the package back, as an educator myself, having to, um, to teach my child on the, he, he wasn't even taught on the online platform because what they were doing, they were sending the work to them through this platform called Frog. So they had to do the work and then email it back. Okay. This is not engaging for a lot of students. For me as an educator, I'm trying to help when I'm looking at his work and I'm falling asleep because it is not motivating. And I'm trying to motivate him because he needs to do the work. And something else, we need to look at other ways because just yeah. sending the work for the student for them to do is not, it's not engaging enough. Right. Some people who I don't know. have the internet access, I understand because they don't have the internet access. So even though you're trying to teach them online, you cannot reach them because there's nothing to reach them on. However, some students who've got internet access, I feel that it's got to be a proactive as much as possible, other yeah. than just sending the work through whatever platform and then they have to do it and then send it back. It's a challenge. Yeah. So I must say as an educator, my child did not, um, <laughs> Yeah. I have tried. <laughs> I've heard that from several teachers whose kids were not engaged. It's the same thing. And this other teacher I was telling you who goes out to people's homes, that was one of her grouses. She was saying that, you know, of course, most of us, of us are diligent and, you know, we try hard to engage our kids, but there is going to be that teacher who will just not care. You know, we'll not try to find the kids, we'll not follow up, and those kids will be lost. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go, Debbie, I wanted to correct what I said. My union said the benchmark for my the union, the big union, was the infection rate of those tested must be below 5%, and the okay. transmission rate must be less than 1%. I didn't want to misquote them. So that's okay. what they said. So I... In terms of my stress level, I'm a little appeased by that because I trust that they will do the right thing for, our, for educators. That's the thing. It's just, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a vacuum, eh? Because we don't know what's happening. The interesting thing about it is the, the, um, the resigning rate in America is much higher than what I'm seeing in terms of England, because I've got quite a lot of um, educators from the US on my platform. And they, some of them actually sending the letter that they have actually written to the district saying that they're resigning, you know, among the pressure and the tears, because they feel that they have no option. They've been right. forced to go back when they feel that there isn't enough security in place in, terms, sorry, in terms of safety in place. Yeah. yeah, it's life or death. I mean, this morning I heard on the news where we have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the infection, the rates of infection. So it's bad. We have 2 million plus people infected 
and 150,000 dead. I mean, it's it's serious. That's high. It is serious. So, what did you say, Milita? I said that's high. It's very high. Very high. Serious. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and then you see what actually gets me in terms of the added stress for educators, they are being forced or they're going to be fired. They've been, some of them are being forced to go back, even though the infection rate is increasing. And some of them are forced to go back and say, well, you don't need, really need the mask, etc. So there's so many conflicting information out there when it comes to educators going back in the classroom. It's, it's quite frightening. Depends on the state you live in, as I said before, yeah. yeah. And yeah. If you're in, I know one state right now, um, the union is suing the governor because they are being forced to go back to in-person class. And this is one of the states that have not been practicing the social distancing protocols and masks are not mandatory and they're being forced. So the union is now suing the governor. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is quite um, quite sad because when you look in terms of the, the stress level, you see there's another factor of this as well, because you have parents that are saying that I need to go back to work because yeah. I need to, to survive. I cannot afford to stay home any longer because my job doesn't require me to stay home. It is not conducive to me staying home. So I need to get back to work. For me to get back to work, my child needs to get back to school. So yeah. that's another aspect. I, I understand. What do we do? I mean, yeah. I mean, in my community, I'm not sure about Melita's community, but in my community, in a community where I teach, um, a certain percentage of the daycares were allowed to stay open. Because as I said, a lot of our parents are frontline workers. So I know that there were daycares that and more of them are open now. And that has been a problem for, my, for our parents. Like we shut down, but most of our parents were still at work. We were able to go, we were able to work online. Most of my parents had to physically go to work still. Yeah. So for them, there was no change. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the thing about it. And more more and more parents will have to go back to work because they need to survive. The economy needs to survive. But the sad thing about it is, how do you ensure that the children that is coming into the physical classroom are safe? You see, this is such a it's, it's such a sad situation. Because parents can't, some parents cannot leave the children at home while they go to work. Because you, even though some schools might decide to operate an uh, online platform, parents cannot leave the children at home while they actually go to work. So it's a catch-22. It's, it's, it's a sad situation which no one has answers for. Yeah. I don't know about, um, I'm not sure for Melita and for you, I know here, if a kid, I think it's 12 or 13, I think that is the age at which kids can start being home alone. I might be wrong, it may have changed, but I know um, in the, when I first had a daycare, 12 or 13 was a cutoff and kids could stay home alone, but not for younger kids. Younger kids cannot be home alone. Otherwise it's a okay. case of neglect, you know? Okay. For safety reasons, just for safety reasons, because, you know, once they are 13 and above, you trust them to take care of themselves, okay, without getting injured or getting in uh, right. any fights and the rest. But when they are younger than 13, you worry that they might not know the safety rules around the house. Uh, with things changing, okay, most parents, when their kids are about 10, they leave them. They make sure they have food at home. They make sure, okay, they tell them, don't open the doors for strangers. Or if you need food, this is where to get food. This is what to do. So most persons don't practice that safety uh, rule. Again, it's just, if I have to go out, I need to make sure that the kids have lunch. They have dinner in case I don't come back before then. So most times they're not worried about the age anymore. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's daycare like for you, Melita? Like in um, Nigeria, um, are parents, are daycares still open? Do no. 
No daycare, no nursery, no primary. Okay, Nothing. So, so, so everything is transition online for you guys over there. Yes, we've been online, strictly online. Everything is online. No daycare, no nursery, no primary, no secondary, no tertiary, nothing. Everything is just on lockdown for now, okay? So we're trying to, you know, see how far we hoping by the end of uh, August or between now and the end of August, they'll decide on what to do next. We don't really have anything tangible to hold on to. The only classes we're having now going back to school, we have the transitional classes and it's for, I think for grade six, uh, the year nine, and then the ones going to the university, we call them the grade six, JSS three, and then the SS three, okay? They have to come back to school to write their, their exams. But apart from these classes, we don't have plans for any other set. Right, 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 right. So you guys have actually are really transitioning into the platform, you know, and that, you know, so which means that primary school are on the platform as well, or just they've been forgotten. What's the situation with nursery and primary school? No, we've all been on the platform from even oh, okay. my, we had the preschool from preschool to the primary six. We had all of them on the platform. And then I had a, another school I was actually going to, you know, look out for to see what they were doing. They had all their classes online from preschool to SS3. That's the class graduating to university. They were mm -hmm. all online. We've been online. Some schools were not able to go online because mm -hmm. maybe their parents did not want to pay for the services. They had complaints about connecting, okay, gadgets and internet uh, subscription. But for those who had maybe 70% of their parents cooperating, we all did online. Okay. okay. We did online for the past few months. Okay, 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 okay. Right, thank you very much for tips. What tip would you give educators who are listening to this and the anxiety level of you know, we've actually passed one set of anxiety level because we're already on the platform. We know how to manipulate the platform. We know how to, to find ways of teaching on the platform. So that level of stress, overwhelm and anxiety now reduce. But now we have a new set of stress we are going into. The stress of uncertainty as to what is going to happen and what would it look like for September, some of us are going back in September, and some of us are going back in August. What does it look like going back into the physical classroom? If our government is saying, well, you have no choice than to do the physical classroom, and we also know that, okay, it's not too safe. What would be some of the things you are going to say to educators to reduce the level, bearing in mind that you have no control over situation because in terms of whether or not we transition into the physical classroom or we continue onto, onto the online platform, I personally don't feel that we have much of a choice because nobody's listening to educators. The only way they're going to listen if we decide, you know what, dumb tools, there is nothing for, we're not going to go back into the physical classroom because we don't see there is enough things in place to ensure that it is safe to go back in relationship to the distance the students are going to be, you know, the students have to be sitting, et cetera. And that's something that's been playing on my mind quite a bit because I'm thinking the classroom as I know it, I cannot see the distance can be done in relationship to that. Secondly, I'm also visualizing the corridors. How are you going to allow the students to use the corridor? Are we saying that one class or two classes at a time would be let out for break time or are we reducing the break? The lunch time I can understand because you could start that break, the lunches. The other question is, are we gonna have less lessons? You know, the lessons would be cut shorter because we have to accommodate for the time when, you know, one class goes out, the other class stays in. I just cannot, I just cannot see what it looks like. And because I cannot see what it looks like, the uncertainty, it add to my anxiety. I'm not too sure it's stress, it add to anxiety. I'm feeling, I am feeling a little bit more anxious than I am feeling stressed. Anxious because 
I don't know what this looks like. And concern as educators because educators are control freak or control yeah. obsessed. That's my word I keep on using. Educators yeah. are control obsessed. And because yeah. I cannot visualize what my classroom would look like, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with it because I have no control over it. Okay. So what are you guys, you know, what's happening? Okay. The, the tips I've been looking at so far for me is, one, you cannot change it, so don't fight it. I'm not fighting the change, I'm working with the change. When you work with a particular situation, the anxiety level will drop. Mm. If they keep saying it's not safe, it's not safe, you keep saying, oh, how am I going to cope with this? You're already panicking. Okay, mm. the anxiety level and the stress will grow. I am not fighting the change. I am working with the change. Mm. Most of us teachers, educators, we're actually perfectionists. <laughs> we're perfectionists in the sense that whatever we want to do, our passion drives us to a point where if it is not good enough, we already feel like failures. Mm. So what you have to do at this point is you will not judge yourself. Mm. Let your perfection your perfection, uh, perfectionist uh, zeal, you know, go down a bit. You will do your best. Mm -hmm. You will do your best to carry as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you burn out, that will be the end. And mm -hmm. you don't want to burn out. Mm -hmm. Now we have situations where we have kids that we have to also worry about. You mm -hmm. have to be strong to worry about the kids. You have to plan your lessons, but know that it might not go as you have planned them. Mm -hmm. you know, we have our lesson plans, but we have to worry more. Not about what we have written down, what we have to give, but how well we have to give it. Mm -hmm. I worry more about, okay, if they come to school and I have to resume, and a child coughs. I have to tell myself, oh, I'm, I might just get infected by this uh, child. So am I not mm. be thinking about if I've taught the maths the way it should go, or if the mm. child can spell at that moment, my stress level might shoot up. So I am mm. not telling mm. myself. We teach us, we're going back as we're going back as a bipolar individuals. While you are <laughs> teaching, the other part of you is worried. So in as much as you want to control the stress level, you have to also be honest with yourself. This is not the point where you have it all fixed. You don't have it all fixed. One day at a time. One day at a time. You just be happy by how well today has gone. So it is not going to shoot for me and I'm going to encourage everyone out there. You have to read too. Don't just listen to the news. You read, get better. Do online courses. Keep yourself busy. Keep your mind busy. When your mind is busy, you're not really crying over what you cannot change. So that's what I've been doing. So it's like the stress is not really showing on me, but I've told myself I cannot fight it. It can only get better from here. So that's, that's just what I've done so far. Yeah, thank you. I agree with you. That we have no control over it, so... There is no point in beating up yourself. And something you rightly point out, education, educators are perfectionists, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is so very true. That I forget, I know you know, I remember um in terms of we are control obsessed, but I forgot about the perfectionists. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Michelle, what are you know, what are the tips? I would say um everything that Melita said and I think I'm going to look to those who have expertise. Mm -hmm. I have expertise in my content area and mm -hmm. people have expertise for that reason. So mm -hmm. maybe it's easier for me to say since my district is looking towards the CDC guidelines, I'm looking towards those people as you know, experts in setting up protocols in mm -hmm. my, my school. I'm looking to my union who have expertise in managing teachers. I'm mm -hmm. looking to those who have expertise in PDs. For example, I took a PD, as Monita said, keep yourself busy. I took a PD 
on rebuild, reopening and rebuilding. And I actually delved into some areas I never thought about in my own room. I was able to create my own plan for reopening my own room. And it opened mm -hmm. my eyes to some things I did not give thought to. So I would mm -hmm. say delve more into that. Mm -hmm. You know, educate yourself and look to experts. And if that fails, then go with what suits you. Mm -hmm. Go with what is best for your health, your family, and your sanity. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that. Thank you. I think that's important. In, you know, you need to be true to yourself. And if true to yourself means that you are going to resign, that is it, because you need to be true to yourself. And I think it's so important that, you know, we remember ourselves first, ourselves second, and ourselves last. Self-care, self-care, self-care. Self-love and true to yourself. Because in the end of the day, you no one else could love you more than you love you. And that's important. That's one of the things that educators are constantly failing to do the self-love aspect you know there's no need to be a martha because there's no point in that we are already automatic carers because majority of you know the teaching profession are female so we need to take care of ourselves and self-care is not selfish i keep on repeating that the lack of self-care is selfish because when you don't take care of yourself, it means that when you actually fall sick or you burn out, someone else has to replace you in your classroom. So that is even more stressful for the school and your family. So it is cheaper to take care of yourself than waiting until you burn out before you take care of you. You cannot give from an empty vessel. You need to make sure you have enough so that you could give. So educators, you guys need to remember that you always need to look after yourself first. It is not selfish. You need to make sure you have the best. The best has to be for you. It cannot be for anyone else. It doesn't make sense. Why should you give the best to someone else? What would you be given? You need to look after you. So it is important that we as educators, yes, it is challenging time. Yes, it is stressful time, but, you know, in the midst of all of that, you know, we do, you know, we do coming through in terms of where we are at. So that's something we need to actually be mindful of as well. Yes, Milita, I've actually, <laughs> internet cut off. It seems that, yeah. You know, these are some of the challenges we have when we actually have, um, some educators from different parts of the world because in terms of India and in Africa, the internet tend to be very dodgy. Okay, thank you everybody for listening to us. We not morning, we're just explaining some of the challenges at the stress level we have as educators, our parents and our students because in this is a triangle because it's like the parents, the educators and the child and everybody in this triangle are stressed because it is very uncertain and it is an unusual setup. This is not what we're used to. However, out of all of that, there's lots of positive because we've actually realized what works and what doesn't work and how we need to do things differently if we actually transition in onto the online platform again in September because we now know a lot more than we did before. So that in itself is positive. Yeah. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you. Good evening, good night, good morning where you are. And I would ask you to like, share and comment. I'll be back on tomorrow with another educator or educators from around the world who would be sharing some of the challenges and some of the triumph, because we need to remember, although there are lots of challenges, there are also lots of triumph as well. We just have to be still and look into it because out of every negative, there's positive. And I must say for most of us, whether or not we want to accept it or not, a lot of the positive is we've actually gained new skills. Sometimes it's been stressful to gain it, but we gain new skills, which right. we need to be honest with ourselves that yes, 
It's been challenging, but at the same time, we've learned a hell of a lot on the platform. And we need to own it instead of just seeing the negative of COVID-19. It is right. not all negative. There have been a lots of pluses because we've actually seen the beauty of our students, how creative a lot of them have become or how a lot of them have been. And we never knew that because we never had the opportunity to, to tap into their creativity. So those are things we need to be grateful for what right. this online platform have actually given us. We need to be honest about it because it has given us quite a lot. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Stay blessed.